The next day, Madame Lavalette came to see me for the first time during four months. Her pale, emaciated, and dejected countenance made me shudder. Her voice was scarcely audible, and during half an hour, I could not draw a single word out of her. She recovered, however, by degrees and acquainted me with the particulars of the reception she had met with from the king. She came alone, but Count Carvoisin came to fetch her and conduct her home. Gratitude does not permit me to forget that worthy friend. I had known Monsieur de Carvoisin eight years before at Suren, where we were country neighbors. He had at that time with him a young niece who afterwards married the Count de clermont Though he had not yet attained old age, he had already some of its infirmities. Subject to an asthmatic complaint from the time of his infancy, he had left the army before the revolution broke out and lived at present the life of a Christian philosopher far from the world he did not love. He was solely occupied with the education of his young ward and with charitable society of which he had urged the establishment and which prospered through his benevolence. We were far from sharing the same opinions on several political questions, but by yielding a little on both sides, the greatest harmony had never ceased to reign between us. I had lost sight of him since the restoration, but he returned to me in my misfortune, and during the last and most terrible month of my confinement, he used to come every day to see me after having assisted at a mass he ordered to be set every morning for my liberation. He was, however, admirably moderate in his opinions. My situation seemed to require for him that he should offer me the comforts of religion. His conversation had a most seducing charm. He gave to his words a devoutness and an openness of heart that touched me, but I was too sincere not to acknowledge that there was no hope of our agreeing. I explained to him in the most simple manner all that it was impossible for me to admit, and he ceased his entreaties without showing the least impatience or the slightest coldness. Now that Madame de Lavalette is about to fill a prominent part of these memoirs, I think fit to enter to some particulars concerning her and our marriage. Louise Emily de Beauharnais was born in 1780. Her father, Francis, Marquis de Beauharnais, had married his first cousin, the daughter of the Countess Fanny de Beauharnais, who has acquired some celebrity in literature, and sister to the Count de Beauharnais, who died a peer of France and whose daughter is now Grand Duchess of Baden, Stephanie. Monsieur de Beauharnais was the head of his family. His brother, Alexandre, who had married Mademoiselle Josephine Tasher de la Pagerie, had two children, Eugène and Hortense. My father-in-law had only one surviving daughter. At the convocation of the States General, Alexandre was elected deputy of the nobility of Blaisois. The eldest brother, Francois, was named supernumerary member of the nobility of Paris and only took his place in the chamber after the 6th of October, 1789, in lieu of Monsieur de Lally Tolendal, who had left France at that period. Alexander embraced the cause of liberty and was rewarded by the scaffold. Francois always voted with the right side, and in 1792, he rejoined the princes at Koblenz. Madame de Beauharnais soon shared the fate of all the nobles who remained in France. She was put in prison, where she stayed more than two years. Young Emily was entrusted to the care of a governess, or rather abandoned to the vulgar caprice of some domestics who shared the movements and passions of the mob. Born of emigrant parents, the poor child was obliged to assist at the patriotic procession which took place every month on the Republican holidays. She often said, I was very ill used on those occasions by my companions, the young girls of the neighborhood. They could not forgive me. My tall stature and genteel features, which contrasted with those of the greatest part among them, the daughter of an emigrant marquis and an imprisoned mother could scarcely share the honor of their company. As for me, the exclusion had nothing disgraceful in my eyes, but my governess, though she had none of the prejudices of my companions, took great care to conduct me to their assemblies for her own interest. 
the least reluctance she would have shown for it might have exposed her to be arrested. At that terrible period of madness and fanaticism, private life was subject to jealous and perpetually supervision. The porter of a nobleman's house was obliged for his individual safety to become a spy and an informer. The servants were again the masters, or rather the tyrants, of those who employed them. They were displeased that the daughter of an emigrant was not bound in apprenticeship, and that she maintained in her manners and occupations something genteel and delicate. The two cousins of Emily were both apprentices, Hortense to her mother's mantua maker, Eugène to a joiner in the Faubourg Saint-Germain. The ninth Thermidor, having overthrown tyranny, Madame de Beauharnais got out of prison, and Emily was sent with her cousin to a boarding school, which Madame Campan had established at Saint-Germain en laye There she continued her education, which had been interrupted during two years. General Bonaparte, to whom I was at that time aide de camp, had sent me in 1796 to Paris that I might follow the motions of the two councils in the directory. I had written to him the truth with a frankness that made him sensible how dangerous and how disgraceful it would be to confirm by his assent the coup d'etat of the 18th Fructidor. The directory soon became acquainted with my opinions, and though they dared not punish me for them, they expressed so great a resentment that General Bonaparte did not think fit to take me with him to Paris when he returned from the Army of Italy. He left me at the Congress of Rastatt. I rejoined him only three weeks before his departure for the Egyptian expedition. All my comrades had obtained advancement. The general wished to reward me also, but not willing to expose himself to a refusal from government, he determined to bring about a marriage between me and Mademoiselle Beauharnais. One day, when I had accompanied him to the treasury to expedite the sending off of the sums that were required at Toulon for the fleet, he ordered his coachman to drive along the new boulevards that he might have at his leisure a conversation with me. I cannot make a major of you, he said. I must therefore give you a wife. You shall marry Emily de Beauharnais. She's very handsome, very well educated. Do you know her? I have seen her twice. But general, I have no fortune. We are going to Africa. I may be killed. What will become in that case of my poor widow? Besides, I have no great liking for marriage. Men must marry to have children. That is the chief aim of life. Killed, you certainly may be. Well, in that case, she will be the widow of one of my aides de camp, a defender of his country. She will have a pension and may again marry advantageously. Now she is the daughter of an emigrant that nobody will have. My wife cannot introduce her into society. She, poor girl, deserves a better fate. Come. This business must be quickly settled. Talk this morning with Madame Bonaparte about it. The mother has already given her consent. The wedding shall take place in eight days. I will allow you a fortnight for your honeymoon. You must then come and join us at Toulon on the 29th. It was then the 9th. I could not help laughing all the while he spoke. At last I said, I will do whatever you please, but will the girl have me? I do not wish to force her inclinations. She is tired of her boarding school, and she would be unhappy if she were to go to her mother's. During your absence, she shall live with her grandfather at Fontainebleau. You will not be killed, and you will find her when you come back. Come, come, the thing is settled. Tell the coachman to drive home. In the evening, I went to see Madame Bonaparte. She knew what was going forward and was kind enough to show some satisfaction and call me her nephew. Tomorrow, she said, we shall all go to Saint-Germain. I will introduce you to my niece. She will be, you will be delighted with her. She is a charming girl. Accordingly, next day, the general, Madame Bonaparte, Eugène and I went in an open carriage to Saint-Germain and stopped at Madame Capant's. The visit was a great event at the boarding school. All the young girls were at the windows, in the parlors, or in the courtyard, for they had obtained a holiday. We soon entered the gardens. Among the 40 young ladies, I sought anxiously her who was to be my wife. Her cousin Hortense led her to us that she might salute the general and embrace her aunt. She was, in truth, the prettiest of them all. Her stature was tall 
and most gracefully elegant. Her features were charming, and the glow of her beautiful complexion was heightened by her confusion. Her bashfulness was so great that the general could not help laughing at her, but he went no farther. It was decided that we should breakfast on the grass in the garden. In the meanwhile, I felt extremely uneasy. Would she like me? Would she obey without reluctance? This abrupt marriage and this speedy departure grieved me. When we got up and the circle was broken, I begged Eugène to conduct his cousin to a solitary walk. I joined them and he left us. I then entered on the delicate subject. I made no secret of my birth nor of my want of fortune and added, I possess nothing in the world but my sword and the good will of the general. I must leave you in a fortnight. Open your heart to me. I feel myself disposed to love you with all my soul, but that is not sufficient. If this marriage does not please you, repose a full confidence in me. It will not be difficult to find a pretext to break it off. I shall depart. You will not be tormented, for I will keep your secret. While I was speaking, she kept her eyes fixed on the ground. Her only answer was a smile, and she gave me the nosegay she held in her hand. I embraced her. We returned slowly to the company, and eight days afterwards, we went to the municipality. The following day, a poor priest who had not taken the oaths married us in the small convent of the Conception in the Rue St. Honoré. This was in some manner forbidden, but Emily set a great importance on that point. Her piety was gentle and sincere. A few days after our marriage, I was obliged to begin secretly to prepare for my journey to Toulon, where the general had already arrived. It was agreed that Emily should divide the time of my absence between her aunt and her grandfather, who was then 86 years old, but who preserved at that advanced age a sound understanding, an amiable and even temper, and who doted on his granddaughter. I left her without taking leave of her, for our separation would have been too painful. I did not return until 18 months afterwards. My forebodings were not fulfilled. Of the eight aides de camp of the general four perished. Julian and Sokovsky were murdered by the Arabs. Croisier was killed at the siege of saint jean de and Guibert at the Battle of Apukir. Duroc and Eugène Beauharnais were severely wounded. Mirlan and I escaped. Glory and fortune were dearly bought with General Bonaparte. On my return to France, in a short time after the 18th Brumaire, I received an order to go to Saxony with full power to negotiate a peace with Austria in case she might be inclined to do so in the midst of the war. I took Madame de Lavalette with me. Since the year 1792, the people of the north of Germany had not seen a French woman. They were convinced that they were all dissolute persons without education and almost naked. Their astonishment was great when they saw a young woman, perfectly modest, extremely bashful, and dressed with a decorum and good taste that might have served as a model to the most prudish of her sex. The admiration she obtained increased the more she was known. We passed the carnival at Berlin. The whole court, especially the queen, loaded her with kindness and attention. She was the means of destroying the extravagant prejudices that were entertained against the French ladies and of rendering the Germans very fastidious in respect to those that came after her. My stay in Germany was no longer necessary after the victory of Owen Linden. In consequence, the first consul recalled me near his person, and when he placed the imperial crown on the head of Josephine, her niece was named Dame Datour. Her functions were not easy to fulfill. The emperor, who wanted to govern his household as he did his extensive empire, was far from obtaining the same obedience there. He had ordered that the tradespeople who supplied the toilette of the empress should only be admitted into her presence one day a week, that the dame d'atour should assist at all the bargains, keep an account of what was bought, and be answerable for all the want of order. These rules soon displeased the empress. The dame d'atour remonstrated. She fell into disgrace, and by degrees, her functions were reduced to those of a dame du palais. Fortunately for her, the emperor was not dissatisfied with her, but what she had been unable to do, the emperor could not do either. 
and the Lady of Honor, Madame de la Rochefoucauld, could not avoid many petty discussions that made her very uncomfortable. The divorce of the emperor and his marriage with Marie Louise restored Madame de Lavalette to her liberty. From that time, she appeared no more at the Tuileries, so that the catastrophe of 1814 found her prepared and accepting the pain. Her gratitude for the emperor made her feel on this account. She accustomed herself without much trouble to the obscure life she had led for the last three years. I now return to my dungeon. During the night that followed my condemnation, I had written to two of my friends, General Clark and Monsieur Pasquier. I imagined that the former could not forget an important service he received for me when he was disgraced by the directory on the 18th Fructidor. I have kept no secret from you. These are the words of my letter. I revealed everything to my judges. See what you can do for me. Endeavor at least to spare me the horrible agony of the scaffold. Let me be shot by brave soldiers. In that manner, at least, death will almost be a favor to me. I will not give here literally his answer. I shall only mention the following phrase. You have nothing more to do than to recommend your wife and child to the inexhaustible bounty of the cane. The sentence of my death was less painful to me than the perusal of that letter. In my indignation, I was going to write to him all his cruelty made me feel. I, however, contented myself with the agreeable thought that my wife and child would never be found to implore the pity of him who had deprived them of a father and a husband. I was still full of the agitation into which the letter of the minister of war had thrown me when my door was mysteriously opened. A man approached, pressed my hand, and slipping a note into it, disappeared immediately. It was Monsieur Anglais, the prefect of police. The note was from Monsieur Pasquier and contained the following words, Keep up your spirits, all is not lost. His majesty is surrounded by several of your friends, and all that can be attempted to soften him shall be done with courage. Hope still. Among the peers who might interest themselves for me, I was far from reckoning on the Duc de Ragusa. We had been for a long time united by the most cordial friendship, but his conduct towards the emperor in 1814 had separated us, and I broke off our connection. I, however, received a letter from the marshal in which he mentioned, I used to go twice a week to the Tuileries. Now I shall go twice a day. I will speak. I will solicit even till I grow troublesome. Whoever has any heart will join with me, and I hope to obtain my greatest wish in the world. These comfortings of courageous friendship could deceive me no longer. I saw that I had been condemned as Marshal Ney was going to be to serve as an example. He was by his reputation the first on the military hierarchy, while I was in the eyes of the court the most important man in the civil order. The late aide-de-camp of General Bonaparte, first cousin of Prince Eugène, and the Queen of Holland, Hortense, whom they detested, postmaster general during 12 years, and by that circumstance, the depository of a great many secrets. It would be good to stifle. Such was at least their opinion. My death was irrevocable. I therefore sought resignation to regard with a firm eye and make myself familiar with all the details of that death I was shortly to undergo. The turnkeys had frequently described to me the last moments of most of the unfortunate men who had left them for the plastic grave. But I wanted to know all that concerned what they called the toilette. A little before four o'clock, the culprit is brought into the registering room. Scarcely has he crossed the low door that opens into that chamber when the executioner and his men appear. They make him sit down on a bench, take off his coat, cut off his hair and the collar of his shirt, after which they tie his hands behind his back. They lead him thus to the cart that stands waiting at the door. This moment is terrible. Those who, till then, have shown the greatest courage and strength of mind fall into complete dejection and confusion. But the open air and the crowd of people generally revive them on the way. Sometimes also the exhortations of the confessor have their effect. I listened with attention, repeated my questions, multiplied my observations, and asked every day to hear the fearful description over again, sometimes by one person and sometimes by another. There were some who made it with reluctance, but the oldest among the jailers seemed to delight in it. 
By that means, I augmented my sufferings without reason. I experienced a horror and a shuddering that agitated my inmost frame. I walked in dismay up and down my room, and my sleepless nights were terrible. However, by my perseverance in re- Recurring to the same idea, I obtained at last what I so much wished for, a tranquility, at which the turnkeys were themselves surprised. At first, when listening to them, I used to grow pale. I now could hear them without emotion or reluctance. I had some time before concealed in my straw mattress a table knife that belonged to me. I lost all idea of making use of it. I found a sort of glory in challenging death and awaiting it as I would have done on the field of battle.